I'd like to invite you to hear God's word. This is from James chapter 2, and I'll be reading for you verses 14 through to verse 26. What, it, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a, a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his action were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. I ask you if you would to please pray with me. Oh God, we do thank you for your word because we know as your word testifies that the scriptures are, are holy, inspired, that they are alive and active. And so, Lord, as we seek your face, as we seek your truth today, we ask for the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, God. Help us to have understanding, but also, Lord, also, Lord, convict us and give us the faith to respond, the faith of application. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're starting a, a two-part series today. It's a short series, but a very important series because it is about uh, living faith, living out our faith. And we're coming from James chapter 2, and I'm quite sure that you, um, that you saw that this is, this is a, a word of rebuke from James, who actually is the brother of our Lord. He's the leader of the early church in Jerusalem, and this is a word of correction. There is no doubt about it. There are people who are not living the reality of their faith, and he says, your faith is dead. This is, this is a wake-up call. But what we're going to do, actually, and, and if, you know, if you know me much by now, I'm sure you know this, uh, I, I prefer kind of to come from the positive direction, right? I prefer to come from the direction of intentionality and desire. That is, uh, not to wake you up with the negative, your faith is dead, but that we would come at this together I actually want a living faith. I want to have a faith that is fully alive, and I want to pursue that. That's how I want to wake up. Um, when I was uh, a part of the youth group back home, this over in Plant City, um, uh, <laughs> we, we would have what's called a lock-in. Now, I'm not sure if you are familiar with the concept of the lock-in, but if you are not, I'll just tell you it is an event designed to make youth directors go insane, <laughs> right? About 3, 3.30 in the morning, they just completely lose their minds, right? That's, that's what they're designed to do, and they do it well. They really do. Uh, but the point on the students on their side is to stay up all night long locked in the church, right? So but at this particular event, uh, I, was, I was pretty young, and so I wasn't quite into or up to that whole staying up all night thing. And... And also, I'd had a long week at school, so I, in the middle of the night, I just want to sleep. Now, my brother, who's actually five years older, so he was like one of the older students in the youth group, he decided that I shouldn't be asleep, right? So he's trying to wake me up. He shakes me. He's yelling in my face. But I don't wake up, right? I'm just, I'm just out. So he does the very logical thing, right? The next step would be you go and gather some friends and get them to come and help you wake your little brother up, right? And so he comes, and they do everything from, you know, not just yelling, but they turn on loud music. They're shaking me. They're rolling me around. They're pouring ice water on me. It doesn't matter what they do. I am not waking up. So again, they do the most logical thing. They pick me up, and they carry me to where they could put me in a closet at the church. Because, after all, 
you know, you should go for the maximum level of confusion for when you wake up and you don't know where you are and you are, in fact, in a closet in the church, right? So that night was great for me, so you can tell I really love lock-ins. I hope we do many of them here. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but here's, and I actually do have a point with this. Here's the point. There, there are different ways to wake up. And uh, to be honest, um, I'd rather wake up to the smell of bacon cooking than to wake up from my brother yelling in my face, right? And so we're going for the bacon variety of waking up in this sermon series, right? That if, if James says there's a faith that is dead, that means, that means if we come at this from the backside, that means there is a faith that is fully alive. And, and I, you know, knowing you all uh, already, I just know this, I know that you desire that sort of faith, that faith that's going deeper and deeper in trust of Christ, deeper and deeper in intimacy with him and in faithfulness to him. And so that's what we're seeking in this series. Now, um, there, there is kind of a catch in this. And here's where I think people uh, have stumbled and where the people James is addressing have stumbled. Here's the catch. What we know is that we are not saved by what we do. We can't do enough. We can't be enough to ever merit our salvation. And so it took God himself, the Son of God, coming in the flesh to come into our midst to show us what life is and then, and then to die so that we could actually enter into the kingdom of heaven, enter into life in him. We know that that is a gift. It is unmerited. It is a free gift. It is received by faith. It's, it's like this. Jesus comes to us by the Holy Spirit and he speaks to our hearts and he says, I died for you. I love you like that. I did this for you, personally for you. Will you receive this? And, and faith is the response to say, Jesus, thank you. I believe that you did this for me. I believe that there is salvation in you. And so I'm giving my life to you, Jesus. That's the response of faith. And so we say we are saved by grace alone. It is, it is by the gift of life in Jesus Christ. And we say we we're saved by faith alone. It's just by receiving that gift. It's not something that we do to merit. And so you get to this catch, right? Where some people are saying, well, if that's true, if it's, if it's just a matter of what Jesus did and not what I do, then it doesn't matter what I do. Right? It doesn't matter if I participate in the body of Christ. It doesn't matter if I change my life. It doesn't matter if I continue in sin. It just doesn't matter what I do because I'm saved by grace. And what James says is that that faith, that faith in name only, is kind of like a body that doesn't have a spirit. Instead, there's no animation. There's no, there's no movement. There's no life in that faith. But then we have to be careful on the other side, Right? We have to be careful on the other side because there, there is this temptation on the other side of this to slide into a works righteousness, into a, a religion, self-righteousness sort of model to say, you know, um, Jesus, did you see what I just did? <laughs> did you see that good work? Jesus, in that, did I prove the, the validity of my faith to you? Did you see it, Jesus? Are you... Are you proud of me, Lord? Did I earn some credit with you, Lord? Did I prove to you that my faith is real? And so we either, we either grow pride in our hearts, self-righteousness in our hearts, or we become frantic and afraid. We're frantic trying to, how can I find enough good deeds, good works to do? Have I done enough yet, Lord, to prove that my faith is real? How can I find some more to do? What is the quota, Lord? I don't know. What is the quota? Would you just tell me so that I can do that many and prove my faith is true. But here's how I believe, and I believe this is a biblical model. Here's how I believe God wants us to look at this relationship of faith and works. I believe that, that God would have us to see that when we enter into faith in Jesus Christ, we are beginning in that day, in that moment, an eternal adventure with the Lord, right? That that's what we're starting that day. We are starting a walk with the Lord. We are walking with him on an eternal adventure that begins that day, and he has a plan for that adventure. He has a plan for our lives. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we read this. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so we don't have to run around frantically trying to figure out what our faith quota is. How can we prove our faith is real to God? We don't have to run around frantically. All we really have to do is take upon our shoulders the yoke of Jesus Christ, the yoke of obedience, the yoke of servanthood to Christ that He promises us is easy. 
the burden of which He promises us is light. We need only to take upon us the yoke of Jesus Christ. Because He has it, he has it in hand. <laughs> He has good works prepared in advance for us to do. He has set them up and they are ready for us to participate in His eternal plan of salvation. He has acts of generosity set up for us. He has acts of service set up for us. He has ways that we are to build up His body, the church, that are set up and ready for us. And it is for us then to leave our hearts open to us, to have hearts that are soft before Him, have hearts that are close to Him, have minds that are open to Him and willing to follow the prompting of His Holy Spirit. Now, as we strive for that faith, as we, as we strive for that adventure, we seek to stay on and to live fully into that adventure with God. Uh, James, he gives, us, he gives us three different types of faith in the Scripture. Uh, and I think we could think of them as sort of um, levels of progression in our faith. And so as we strive for this living faith, I want to bring these before us. Those are saving faith, living faith, and completed faith. So first of all, we see that he brings before us a saving faith. He asks a really startling question. He says of those who are having a faith in name only, he says of them, can can that sort of faith save them? Can such faith save them? You know, one of the things that amazes me about humankind, and I obviously I'm including myself, I'm speaking to myself in this too. One of the things about humankind that amazes me is that we are so self-centered, we are so self focused that we actually believe we really believe this we believe that we should determine the terms of our relationship with God we really think that right that God um, I'm willing to do these things but not these things God I'm willing to give you access to these parts of my life but not these parts of my life and we actually believe that we are entitled to dictate our relationship to God now think about it in our hearts who we're speaking to We are speaking, we are addressing with our hearts the God of the universe. (laughs) He made us, and in the flash, in the the twinkling of an eye, He could unmake us. We We are speaking to the God who is so holy that apart from the grace of Jesus Christ, we could never enter His presence without just being completely undone. That's who we're speaking to, and we are saying, God, you know what, I'm in charge. I'm going to tell you how this relationship's going to go. When in fact, and Jesus is really clear about this, He says to us, anyone who would be my disciple, if you want to come to me, if you want to be my disciple, here's what that relationship looks like. He is very specific about this. He says, if you would be my disciple, anyone who wants to be my disciple, they must deny themselves. Deny themselves. Take up their cross daily and follow me. That's what Jesus says. That's what he says is the shape of this relationship. Friends, when we come to God, we are repenting. We are turning away from the world and to him. We are turning away from the love of self and to him. We are coming to him saying, Lord, I know that I have nothing, I have nothing to offer you but myself. I don't have any merit with which I could negotiate this relationship with you, Lord. I am coming to you, and you are God, and you have life. And God, because you gave everything for me, I am laying my life down at your feet. You gave everything for me, and I am giving everything to you. See, that's the only response to the ultimate God who is ultimate. That's the only response that makes any sense. And and friends, I don't mean to be harsh about this. I really don't. But Jesus says there's a really clear choice here, and he wants us to be very clear that that this is the choice. We are turning from the world to him. We are turning from the love of self to him. He says if we want to have life, if you want to have life, it's going to be the one who would lay their life down, not the one who wants to save their life. It's the one who would lay their life down before me, Jesus says. You know, Rahab is mentioned, and um, boy, she... uh, (laughs) She's living a pretty dramatically sinful life. But Israel's coming to claim the promised land. And she knows, and she knows that the God of Israel is the one true and living God. And she makes a decision, doesn't she? That she's going to turn her loyalty away from her people and to God. And she hides the spies, and she saves them, and she sends them on their way, and she protects them. She makes her choice, and by that choice, she herself is saved. And so it is with us. Now, secondly, um, and we're going to look at this again. We're going to look at this from the backside. 
James says, if you look at this from the backside, that there is such a thing as living faith. There is a faith which is alive. Uh, he says of those who have a faith that's just about what they say and what they think about God, he says this, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder, right? This is the truth. The demons know that there is one God. The demons know that, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He is the anointed one of God. They know all of that stuff. And yet, they stay demons. And yet, all they can do in response to that knowledge is shudder, is shake in fear. Why? Well, James, he's actually quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. It's what's known in the Jewish faith, and this is really a part of the center of the Jewish faith. It's what's known as the Shema. It starts this way. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The demons know that much. But they cannot get to the second part of this. The second part goes like this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Everything that is in you, love the Lord. Be devoted to the Lord. Surrender to Him. Love Him deeply and passionately and intimately and fully. They can't get to that part, and so they cannot be released from their fear. They cannot be transformed. And so it is that Jesus fulfills the Scripture. He fulfills the Scripture by the Gospel, and here's why. He enables us to love God because He first loved us. He has poured out His perfect love on the cross, and by the, by the Holy Spirit who's been given to us, that love is actually poured into our hearts and friends, we love God because He first loved us. His perfect love, the Scripture says, casts out fear. We are freed from our fear, and we are able to love God, be devoted to Him, to delight in God because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when we do good works, it's not because we're afraid of God. It's not because we're trying to reach some quota to keep our faith intact. It is because we love God in response to His perfect love for us. Finally then, James speaks about a completed faith. He's speaking of Abraham when he says, His faith was made complete by what he did. That's what completed his faith. That's what has brought his faith to fulfillment, to what God intended it to be. His faith was made complete by what he did. God made a promise to Abraham. God said, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. You're going to have so many children, you, you don't even know how to count that many. You're going to be a blessing. I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. You're going to be the father of this priestly nation, this people after my heart, this people for me, this people who are going to spread the knowledge of God to the end of the earth. This is the promise. And Abraham knew that Isaac, because God had told him that Isaac was the son of the promise. He was the child of promise. And then one day, God says, I'm going to need you to sacrifice Isaac. And it must have been a, a moment of great confusion for Abraham. But that was never the point. It was never the point. Isaac was never in danger. God was never going to let his sacrifice actually happen. God was teaching Abraham that the promise would not come through Isaac. It did not depend on Isaac. That the promise depended on God. And so, as they go up the mountain, you remember in the story that God provides a scapegoat, right? That Isaac wouldn't be sacrificed. God provides a scapegoat for him. And we find out later in the book of Hebrews that the reason Abraham was able to walk those steps up that mountain is that he believed that God could raise the dead. He believed God when he said, this is the child of promise, and he believed that even if he had to raise Isaac from the dead to fulfill this promise, he would do it. And so, I bet this is, right, this is starting to sound familiar. And so we're seeing actually the real point of this story, the ultimate point of this story, and that is to point to Jesus Christ. Because our Heavenly Father, there was a day when our Heavenly Father gave His Son. And His Son, Jesus, would not have a scapegoat provided for Him because, in fact, Jesus is our scapegoat. And He would die for us. Once for all, all sufficient sacrifice for us, right? And in fact, God can raise the dead. And God did raise Jesus from the dead. And He lives and reigns together with Father and Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. And He is love, and He is light, and He is beauty, and He is salvation, and He is peace. And He has secured our salvation, and He has secured our place in the kingdom of God. He has transferred us from the kingdom of this world of darkness into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of His Son, 
Jesus Christ. And He has made of us a new creation, friends. He has made of us a new creation created in Christ Jesus to do good works that He has prepared in advance for us to do. And here's where our faith is made complete. Here it is. Our faith is made complete in knowing that we have a place secured in eternity for us. This is where our faith is made complete. And our faith is made complete by knowing, by knowing that God actually has a place for us to participate in His eternal plan of salvation. That when we work out these good works prepared in advance, that God is actually using them to change lives and to do so eternally, right? And friends, there is nothing in this world, I don't care what you have, what position, how much money you have, there is nothing that we could do or have in this world that would fulfill us more than this because that is our purpose. We are made, friends, to make a difference and to do so for eternity, and that's where our faith is made complete. And so, and so the invitation today is to journey with God on this grand adventure this eternal adventure with him. James says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called, get this, he was called God's friend. Imagine being so at peace with God. Imagine walking so closely with God. Imagine our hearts being so in tune with God's heart that we would be called his friend. Friends, that is the fulfillment, that is the completion of our faith. And so as we come and um, receive this holy sacrament, where we experience the presence of Christ, we experience the grace of Christ, let me just bring this back before us, friends. Seek, let's seek in our hearts a saving faith where we are laying down our lives before God, saying, I know that I am no longer my own, I am bought with a price a living faith, a living faith. where We are walking together with the Lord each day and we are responding to His love by loving Him back in all that we do. And, and finally then, may we seek a complete faith where we know, we know, Lord, this life is yours. I'm in your hands. You have a plan for my life. I'm going to walk with you today and every day. Lord, it is my desire to be your friend. It is my desire by your grace to be your friend. May it be. May it be. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that salvation is a gift. Because God, we know in our heart of hearts that we, we could never do enough. We could never be enough. And so as we seek to respond to what you have done, especially to what you have done on the cross of Jesus Christ, Lord, we ask for faith, that we could receive, we could appropriate this gift of life, and we could live it not just for one hour on Sunday, but that we could live out that life each and every day. Lord, what we're praying for is a living faith. And we thank you as we lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen.